Hello, my name is Barbara Kay. And on behalf of my co-host Susan Pertnoy and the Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County, I'd like to welcome you to our program, Mosaic. Our focus today is the world premiere of the opera, Enemies, A Love Story, based on a novel by Isaac Bischeva Singer. We'll be back with our program and our guests after this brief message. It was a shock when my smart, strong husband had a stroke. His mind was agile, but everything else failed him. I didn't see how he could possibly recover. But through patience, skill, and compassion, the caregivers at Morse Life brought him back to himself. They brought him back to me. Morse Life Short-Term Rehabilitation. Morse Life. Honoring Senior Living. Welcome to Mosaic, Daniel Biagi. Thank you very much. I have to tell you, you're the director of the Palm Beach Opera. That is something. Do you it, feel proud? <laughs> I, I am. <laughs> it's been incredibly rewarding to be the leader of this uh, opera company that has grown so tremendously over the past couple of years, has a long history in Palm Beach, and at the same time has found ways to reinvent itself over the past couple of years to, to steadily look towards the future. Well, that's thanks to you, actually. They were having some, some challenges before that. Tell me, what got you into the opera? I was an opera singer first, myself. Okay. And uh, so I always sang as a kid. Eventually, I went through training at the Conservatory of Music in San Francisco and the Manhattan School of Music. And then I stayed in New York and uh, started to sing a bit and then switched into artist management. So I was an artist manager in New York for a while and then switched onto the side of an opera house when I joined the Palm Beach Opera, first in the artistic department, and then as general director in 2009. Okay, well that's a shabby uh, uh, continuity there. <laughs> yeah. Tell me, uh, what kind of demographic, by and large, goes to the opera? You know, it's mixing more and more, I would say. It's, uh, obviously in Palm Beach County, we have um, a little bit of a different demographic than elsewhere in the country at times. We certainly have a, a large retirement population that joins us at the opera company. But we also have, thanks to our education and outreach programs throughout the school systems and with young professionals, more and more young people who join us. Um, I'm always the one to say, you know, the, when I come into our opera halls and I see them filled with people between their 60s and 90s who are so active and so alive. Yeah. I keep saying, well, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that picture. You want to lead a long, happy life, go to the opera. And I compliment everyone who goes to the opera in their 90s. It keeps yeah. them healthy. It, the music keeps their, their spirits alive. And so we do our job. Yeah, but the older people really had yeah. much more of, um, how should I say it, much more experience. It's hard to reach yeah. out to get the younger people involved. It really is. It's a little bit different now, yeah. So, and that's where we also realized if we, we need to really focus our efforts on um, kindergarten, pri primary years in school, middle Get school, them custom up to, to it. college, yeah. exactly. And then it's okay if they disappear for 20 years. We all know that <laughs> between 25 Who's gonna, and well, 50. Where are they going to go with it? <laughs> <laughs> they, have, they have other interests, right? Uh -huh. they have, they've built their careers, they built their families. That's true. It's okay for 20, 25 years people disappear, as long as when they're 50, they come back to the opera and then stay with opera until, until their 90s. Then that's still many, many years in the opera house. You know, uh, we're here because mm -hmm. one of the reasons, aside from the fact that I, I love talking to you and I like introducing you to the uh, public, mm -hmm. um, the enemies love story of my people a love story. Yeah. Uh, it's an opera that's really a, kind of a first opportunity here. What got you involved with that? It is. It is, it is a first for, for everyone involved. Um, we started talking about this world premiere already about five years ago when a friend of mine from New York called me and said, you know, we have this new opera by a young composer by the name of Ben Moore. Would you be interested in finding out about it? And at that point, I said, for personal interest, I would love to find out. Palm Beach Opera at that time wasn't quite in the position yet to put on a world uh -huh. premiere. But so I, I received the score. I received some of the music examples and uh, really liked what I saw and what I heard. And so we thought we might be able to start a conversation about it and ended up presenting a one opera in one hour version of it two years ago, where we, we contacted the composer, we contacted the librettist, 
and both Ben and Nama said uh, that as much as they were hoping for a fully staged world premiere, they would love to be involved in a one-upper shortened version as well. So they came to Palm Beach, we put it together, we presented it for free at the Harriet Himmel Theater uh -huh. with some of our young artists and just minimal staging, minimal props. It was well with, received. Yeah, piano and exactly two instruments and it was really well received. And at the time, we then also had undergone some leadership changes on the board of the Palm Beach Opera. We restructured the board of directors throughout after the 50th anniversary. Um, the, the 50th anniversary was in many ways a, a chance for us to pay tribute to all those who had for such a long time carried this organization. And at the same time, they were then, thanks to new people coming on board, willing to say, you know, we've done our part for 25 years. Now it's yours. And as it so happened, there were several people who got on board who had already been involved with Enemies A Love Story when they were still in New York, uh, some of our underwriters, and seeing the, the terrific reception at the One Up and One Hour gave us then the courage to take the risk and present a world premiere banking on the excitement of it rather than being afraid of it. You know, the impact of it being a world premiere opera is, is very, very important on this, on this company. It is. It's, it's brought the spotlight to Palm Beach Opera like uh, anything, nothing else we've done before. We have reviewers come from all over the country. We have, in addition to the, to the opera media like Opera News and Musical America and mm -hmm. Opera America, we have also representatives coming from the Financial Times, from the Wall Street Journal. It's made an all impact. These, all these newspapers that otherwise would not pay attention to what's happening in Palm Beach. Yeah. Right? And at the same time, it's, it's really allowed us to not only operatically and artistically, but also locally create new partnerships with different entities in the community where otherwise we might not have had a chance to work with them. Yes, um, my, we're going to talk about it later in the program, but literally uh, it's involved the Federation and its beneficiary agencies too. Exactly. It's amazing, exactly. It's amazing, amazing pleasure. story. Yeah. You just want to give a brief overview of what the story is about? It is an amazing story. It's the, uh, when our director, Sam Helfrich, first arrived here, he said when he tried to put it in one sentence, he came up with the, the, the sentence, it's the story of a man who accidentally finds himself married to three women at the same time. <laughs> it's, that's the one sentence, right? In the story is a little bit more involved. It's the story of Hermann Broder, a Holocaust survivor who survived the wars by being hidden in a hayloft by the, the Gentile servant of his uh, parents, by Jadwiga. And he brings her to uh, New York. They both uh, are able, after the war, to come to New York. They live in Brooklyn. He acts as a traveling book salesman. Um, yet when he says that he's off to Philadelphia or Baltimore to go sell books, he really takes the subway to go to the Bronx to see his and mistress. have a torrid love affair exactly, <laughs> okay. with another Holocaust survivor. And to make matters worse, his first wife, who was presumed dead in the war, shows up in New York and confronts him as well. So he indeed finds himself, after marrying his mistress in a religious ceremony, finds himself married to three women all at once, trying to figure out what happens next. And so it's, on one hand, it's an incredibly touching story. It's a story filled with the traumatic experience that so many people went through, yet also with the hope of a better tomorrow and the sort of the, the, the difficulties of how to, how to make decisions after that, how to go on, how to move forward. All of these characters have to find their own way in this new world. Yeah, don't tell right. them the ending. You want them I to come. I will not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so where yeah. can they see it? They can see it at the Kravis Center for the Performing Arts. We have uh, three performances on February 20, February 21, and February 22 with a great uh, VIP opening night package where we have uh, a cocktail reception beforehand, a wonderful cast dinner, so everyone has a chance to meet the artists with all the representatives after the performance. We'll have a band in the lobby, red carpet arrival, searchlights outside, so it really turns into a big opening night celebration. Sounds wonderful. I wish you a lot of luck. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs> great pleasure to be with you. David Stern, what a pleasure to see you. I know you're rushing from a rehearsal. Always, always rushing from or to a rehearsal. A conductor is, you conduct. I conduct. But I heard that you're an outstanding, outstanding communicator. Well, it's what I like doing. Conducting is I'm always communicating, whether you're on the podium or whether you're in rehearsal or whether you're talking to a singer or to an audience. Uh, it's, it's a constant um, effort in communication. That's the point. Yeah, but the thing is that what I read also about some of your work is that you give an energy and an excitement and a change to the music. 
Music for me is central to my life being. It, in a way, music is my religion. And it's always been in my family and it's what I try to teach to my children and it's what I share with my wife. Your wife's a violinist. She's isn't a violinist, she? yeah. absolutely. Are the children musical too? My, they're both extremely musical. My older daughter uh, sings. She's uh -huh. a mezzo-soprano, but she's also studying literature and, and she's in college. And uh, her younger sister plays the violin, but is looking to other careers. After all, not everyone has to be a musician. No, that's true, that's true. But you have an unusual background. What got you involved in opera? Wow, well, <clears throat> um, I finished my studies at Juilliard uh, in 1989, and mm -hmm. then after that, I was working a little bit at Yale University where I had graduated, but I was a, an associate professor there for a year. And then I had the opportunity to be an assistant conductor at the Théâtre du Châtelet in Paris. And I never left the pit, I never left Paris. Uh, I started working more and more in, in the opera uh, repertoire and many, much more with, uh, with singers and with old, uh, period instruments, Baroque and classical instruments mm -hmm. of the period. And my whole life took its course, a natural course, uh, in France, and now it's been 25 years that we've been living wow. there. How did you connect with uh, Enemies, a Love Story, this opera? I was here last year. I conducted the Macbeth, mm -hmm. and I had a great time with this house. It's a, this is a great opera house. It's a wonderful uh, um, opera company, and I felt very much at home. And during the rehearsal process, I was asked whether I'd be interested in this project. I was kind of the last one to get on board because, of course, uh, Ben and Nama had been writing this piece for seven years. Um, Sam was already uh, asked to direct it when I came on last, but because I came on last, it gave me a certain objectivity to the piece. It was new to me, whereas it had been old to, to Ben. And it's nice to have that different perspective. So when we have discussions, I come to it feeling fresh about the piece. He comes to it having said, well, I wrote this seven years ago, so how do I feel about it now? And so, mm -hmm. so I find it very interesting to come in at this period and to be part of the creative team. It's a great piece. This yeah. piece is unbelievable. The drama of this piece, if you had just come to rehearsals, just to listen to the intensity of the relationship between the music and this text. Uh, Besheva Singer was a speaker, was one of the most important voices of Jewish literature in the 20th century. That is clear. Now to get to the psychological impact that his writing has with someone like Nama who really understands his yeah. text, and mm. Ben, who really wants to make it sing, the combination is that the intensity of the psychology comes through, and the beauty of, of Ben's writing allows us to listen to it very easily. Okay. In other words, there isn't a competition between the librettist and the composer, who's gonna make more of this scene or not. It's a complete tandem. And the result is, is that we're taken into each of these women's stories. I mean, these women have incredible stories oh, to intense, tell. Yeah. And what's going to come out on the stage is going to be intense far beyond anyone's expectations, I yeah. tell you now. Let me ask you something. If this is a brand new opera and, and it's never been played before, do you have any kind of guidelines or you become in inventive or how do you handle something like that? Well, how, personally, 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 I start always with the text. So I take a new opera. Uh -huh. I read the text. I read it like it's, a, it's as if it's a play. Right. And then I start saying, OK, how would these characters seem to me? Would this, would this character be a soprano? Would this character be a bass? And then when I start reading what the composer did, it has, I have a, um, a, a version that's already in me, and I'm starting to say, okay, well, now I understand. He's going for this, and he's going there, and there's a basis. And then I start following their lead, and you find yourself, every time you pick up the score, you find another layer of meaning, a layer of subtlety. And the piece is rich enough that there are such layers. Mm -hmm. And that's what's one, so wonderful, and that's what's so exciting. Because sometimes music today can be so difficult to listen to and so difficult to understand that no, no matter how much you dig, it's very difficult to explain it to an audience. Sometimes the music today is so easy to understand that there's no subtlety and the interest is gone after a few days of rehearsal. Now this piece somehow manages to find that alchemy where you put together the, lang the text and the music and out comes gold. And it comes out in a way that is, enriches us all. It's an incredibly compelling story. It's beautiful music. Yes, you will go home humming tunes, but at the same time you'll be thinking about something that horrible, horrible that happened. 
and how, how victimized the survivors were, how difficult it was to be a survivor. And we all know people who went through this, and we should never forget. So this piece has its role. Of course it speaks to it. The more it speaks about the Jewish situation and the suffering of, of the Holocaust, the more it speaks to a wider audience, ironically. In other words, had we whitewashed it and made it, take, taken it completely out of its context, it wouldn't have done it. But because it's so specifically about the Holocaust, people in the audience will say, well, now I understand the human relationship between what happened to this person and, and this other person. It's a very complex story. It's, 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 it's a crazy story. It's a, in a way, it's a wonderful, funny, tragic Jewish joke. Yeah. And nothing is sadder than a Jewish joke. <laughs> well, 70 years. That's funny. <laughs> so, well, 70 years after... 70 years after the liberation the of, of, uh, uh, liberation of Auschwitz, yep. and the timing is perfect. Perfect. Well... But, but uh, to look at the, the cost, um, the psychological cost on the individual victims is something that, is, <clears throat> that has to be told and retold. And Besheva Singer, he paints a portrait. It's, it's, it is so much of its time. It is so much of, you know, 1948 New York. You couldn't just take this opera and put it into another context, another, no. it just speaks of that time. Um, but because he does it so well and it's so clear as a, a, a language, then we find things in our day to day that to which we can relate. And it's a, it's a very compelling experience. I can't wait to see it. And I want to thank you for sharing that with us. Well, I'm in polite, enjoying talking to you and enjoy talking about the piece and looking forward to this. And yeah. Thank you. You have to come. I would suggest come to, coming to three shows. Three It'll take three shows for everyone to really get to what this piece is about. I hear you. But it's worth it. You hear? Three shows. Three. Three. Federation and our overseas partners support the resurgence of Jewish life in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. We also provide humanitarian assistance wherever Jews encounter poverty and crisis. Community, like every gift, counts. Together, we can ensure a vibrant Jewish future. Federation and you, changing the world together. Welcome back, and welcome Ben Moore, composer, and Nama Sandro, the librettist, for this most anticipated opera. We're very, very thrilled to have you here. Ben, as a composer, your music has been performed by many leading singers, including Audra McDonald's seven-time Tony winner. You've been called brilliant by the New York Times and received many accolades by Opera News. What got you into this business? What got me into it? Well. I guess it started when I was three and four years old, when my parents, who were amateur opera singers, although amateur, I should, I should qualify that they had, my father actually ran a small opera company, oh. upstate New York, in Utica, New York. I was in opera choruses as a kid. You know, the sound of, of music was all around me in my youth. And uh, piano lessons from an early age, um, I probably started writing music down later than most composers, but uh, the inspiration for sure came from my parents. When you write an opera, do you write the music first? Do, when do you write the words? How, how do you collaborate? How does that work? Ben, by the time I started working on the opera, Ben had already written a number of melodies yeah. with words. Um, and then after that, some I fit words, new words to his melodies, and some I brought him new words, and he wrote the melodies. Yeah, she, since Nama came on board a little, uh, a couple years after I began yeah. work on it, um, but I think by now it's almost a hundred percent words that you that you wrote. And, um, Maybe, and, and yeah, the words that I was contributing at the beginning were mostly drawn from the novel anyway. But it's always an interesting question, what comes first? And when I get it, I have to stop and think, well, 
what did come first sometimes. It's hard to yeah, remember. Yeah. Because sometimes it's almost simultaneous. Yeah. You know, Nam and I work very closely together. Yeah. We sit right by the piano together you must. and say, now what's happening in this scene? And what kind of mood are we looking for? Is it unusual to have operas in English, written in English? Well, I mean, um, I think opera composers generally write in their native, or almost universally write in their native tongue. So all our American opera composers have written in English, and British composers, of course. Um, it's just that we're used to the great Italian, German, and French, that that's the core of the operatic World. repertoire that, we're all, that are popular and that we all love. So it's funny, people ask me that too, but I, I wouldn't dare write in the language I didn't um, right, but, know. Right, but yes. here's a naive question. You're, you write the music, so you're essentially couldn't your um, words or lyrics be in any language? That's true, and I long to write in Italian because it's so singable and beautiful, the language. And English has its own challenges, consonants and diphthongs, which make it a little more difficult to sing. But, um, but that's my language, so that, that's what it is. <laughs> Nama, you're a Yiddish scholar, as we've mentioned, and Isaac Besheva Singer was a noble author. Can you give us some background on him because of your expertise in this area? He f is one of the most famous of the modern Yiddish authors, uh, although that's partly, I have to say, because he was the one that got translated the most. And uh, this is my moment to say that there were many other great modern Yiddish writers that aren't as well known. He was very prolific. He wrote for newspapers. He wrote serials. This was a serial originally in oh, the newspapers. Yeah, rather than an entire novel at one at one go. He uh, he came as a young man to this country and wrote here in Yiddish always. Uh, he wrote in different genres. He wrote old country kind of spooky stories, folkloric stories, and he wrote uh, novels set among very sophisticated people in Poland because not all the Yiddish speakers lived in little, they weren't all Tevye, they weren't all right. shtetl dwellers. Shtetl dwellers. Uh, and a lot of very good novels set here among such and enemies, 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 enemies. Such and, enemy. and I want to give you a, con a, a premature congratulations. I think this is going to be so exciting. It will be the premiere will be February twentieth to twenty second at the Kravis Center, and we look yeah. forward to seeing you in action. Thank so, you. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Welcome, Eileen Shapiro. You're a Holocaust educator, formerly of the Palm Beach County School District. What was your position for them? The last position that I had, and I kept it for 13 years, was the Holocaust Studies Program Planner. In 1994, the state mandated that we teach the Holocaust to all children, kindergarten through 12th grade, um, in order to promote a society today that I think we could say we could all be proud of. Um, it gave, they, the state gave every district five years to get their act together, and Palm Beach County hired me four and a half years after the um, mandate to just do that. Oh, so wow. we created curriculum, we, um, everything is literature-based, we uh, hustled a lot of money because mandates come and go, but there's never money that goes with them. So we had to get money from the local community to support the programs we did. And I think we did a really good job with it. I've heard you have. Um, can you talk about some of the programs that you initiated? Sure, I, I'm very proud of them. Um, you know, when I first took the job, the first thing I did was deal with uh, parents whose children were entering kindergarten, very concerned that how could I teach this horrific subject to their ch kindergarten children. And when I said that the book we used in kindergarten was um, The Ugly Duckling, they you could feel them relax. and then. The a book in first grade was a Sesame Street book. 
uh, Dr. Seuss book in the third grade. So by then, I had a lot of community support for what I, I was doing. So. One of the programs that I did was we wrote a grant to have a puppet show created based for first graders based on um, a book called uh, The Crayon Box That Talked. It was about a little girl who received money for her birthday. Um, she picked up a teddy bear. She decided she didn't want a teddy bear. She picked up a doll. She didn't want a doll. But there was a crayon box, and the red hated the blue, and the yellow didn't like the orange. And she decided that she was going to buy that crayon box, and she was going to teach him that if we could all get along together, we could create a beautiful world. The blue and green could create colors. The red and orange could create colors. And that's the message that we give to our elementary kids um, about the program. We, um, we don't even say the word Holocaust until the fourth grade. And then we say it very gently. Um, there's many things we can teach our children. We can teach them to be upstanders. Um, and, um, and those are the things that we need to establish early on. The Palm Beach Opera is collaborating with the Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County in partnership with its agencies to try and teach the Holocaust through the opera enemies a love story. You are on a panel at a community lunch and learn that will take place this Thursday. Can you tell us what you're going to talk about? Sure. What I'm going to talk about is not so much the Holocaust, but the aftermath of the Holocaust. What happened uh, with the survivors who came to this country or elsewhere after the war? There's many things that people don't know. Um, because of the um, uh, people not have, being able to get uh, be vouched for t to come to this country, they wound up in DP camps, and many of the DP camps were concentration camps, just with better food. Ooh. And the last camp was closed in 1957, which is really um, almost, a, it's a terrible thing that society c couldn't find a place for these people. Um, because of the Red Scare in, um, in Europe, and they were afraid communism was coming in, Nazi, convicted Nazi criminals were let out of prison early where Jews couldn't find a homeland to go to. So I think as a community, as a, as a school district, these are things that we need to teach our children. We, we really do. And on that note, I have to say thank you very much for You're all the work welcome. that you do. Thank you. That was a fascinating program, wasn't it? It, it really was. I mm. can't wait to see the opera. Me too. And you come back and see it too. Thank you for being with us. Be with us again next week when we have another look into the Jewish world. Goodbye from Mosaic.